and start. Wonderful. So again, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we have Dr. Philip Grant here with us. He's a clinical researcher and assistant professor in the Division of Infectious Disease. He's also a director of the HIV clinic at Stanford and has a long-standing research interest in optimizing uh, antiretroviral therapy, um, HIV drug resistance, and minimizing toxicity for HIV and its uh, therapy. He also is uh, investigating the immune response to influenza and management of uh, chronic viral conditions uh, in the developing countries. During COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Grant has directed interventional clinical trials in hospitalized COVID-19 patients, uh, also COVID-19 vaccine studies, and the study looking at the long-term effects of uh, um, patients previously infected with COVID-19. So uh, Dr. Grant, thank you so much for uh, your time, for being here and providing us with the lecture on the vaccines the lessons learned and uh, uh, the errors uh, repeated during the pandemic. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I haven't uh, attended these lectures. Hopefully people will find it interesting. Uh, let me uh, share my screen. Let's see. Yeah, this looks good. Share. Okay, and then let me make that bigger. Okay, people can see that, I hope. And hopefully this will be interactive. So please uh, do um, include stuff on the chat. I'm gonna make sure I have my chat open so I can see what people are saying. Uh, I, I initially prepared a, a similar lecture uh, for this uh, back in September uh, when you know so much was happening in terms of the politics of uh, coronavirus and the vaccines. Uh, and I updated it for this uh, time looking back at the last six months as well. So the title I have, it's it has some history of medicine, uh, has some history of vaccines, and also has um, things on coronavirus as well. So here, uh, people have to kind of use their, don't Google it either, it's cheating if you Google the answers also, okay? Um, all right, so um, the outline of today's talk, we're gonna talk about uh, the development of various vaccines through history. Uh, history of vaccine complications and vaccine hesitancy, uh, kind of the general approval process for medication and emergency use ac uh, access mechanism, and then kind of the progress to date uh, in terms of COVID vaccinations and next steps. Uh, so just in terms of people understanding the definition of um, uh, vaccines, according to the uh, Oxford English Dictionary, it's a sub, a, a vaccine is defined as a substance used to stimulate the production of antibodies and prevent immunity against disease prepared from the cause of agent of a disease, its product or a synthetic substitute treated to act as an antigen without inducing the full disease. Um, okay, so first question, uh, origin of the word for vaccine from etymology. People can uh, answer or chat it in. Yep, there we go, from cow. That's good, Joanne and Cindy both were right on it. Uh, from Latin, of or from a cow. And so we'll start uh, there uh, on smallpox. And here's a historical photo uh, looking at a, a young girl with, with smallpox. You can see how disfiguring that could be uh, after all those uh, pox heal. Uh, that's a nurse. Oftentimes they selected nurses who had been immune or had been infected with smallpox to care for uh, children uh, who had who had smallpox. Uh, early on, um, something was called variolation uh, for smallpox, and um, uh, the origin of it is unclear. Um, basically, what variolation was was exposing uh, someone to a bit of smallpox, so they wouldn't get it uh, a severe case of it. The first kind of descriptions of variolation were uh, from China. Uh, from the 1500s, where scab was ground up and then uh, basically blown and in, insufflated into the nose, blown into the nose, the kind of a straw-like structure. Um, you know, they try to select uh, donors who uh, didn't have severe infection, uh, or also um, 
uh, people would boil the scab uh, or store the scab for quite a period of time uh, before they gave it to patients uh, to try, pr try to prevent uh, severe disease. Uh, it was also known to have been practiced uh, through uh, pre-colonial uh, Africa, um, where, uh, the, where the scab was uh, inoculated below the skin. So people would take an old lesion of smallpox and then put it below the skin. Uh, it also is known that in the Ottoman Empire, it was initiated in the 1600s. Uh, the, the technique first came to the U.S. in the 1700s. And here's the first, another question. This one's a little bit harder. Can anyone recognize this historical figure? Think Salem witch trials, if anyone knows that period of time. Okay, we're getting. Uh... All right, so we got uh... anyone, anyone, last chance, five, four, three, two, one. This is Cotton Mather. He was a famous Puritan minister. Uh, in the 16, uh, 1700s in Boston. Uh, so I'm gonna look at the history of variolation in uh, the colonial uh, US uh, based on the story of Onesimus, which I think is always interesting when you hear about or read about stories that aren't widely told. Um, so Onesimus was brought to, brought to Boston as a slave from this, in the 1700s uh, from Ghana. Uh, he was given uh, to Cotton Mather uh, as a gift uh, from his uh, Puritan congregation in Boston. Uh, Cotton Mather uh, named him Onesimus, uh, which is a na Bible, biblical name uh, for uh, a St. Paul's slave. Uh, it, uh, Mather uh, wrote a lot, as people did back then, and uh, he described Onesimus as an intelligent fellow, but also wasn't super trustful of him, maybe because of his independence. Uh, he provided, uh, he, uh, he educated, uh, provided education in Esmus and multiple times tried to convert him to Christianity. Um, kind of continuing on about Onesimus, Onesimus being, uh, from, uh, West Africa, um, you know, know about the, knew about the tradition for, uh, variolation for smallpox. And this is what, um, Mather wrote. He, he asked his, uh, slave Onesimus, who's a pretty intelligent fellow, uh, whether he had ever had the smallpox. Onesimus answered both yes and no, and then told me that he undergo an operation which had been given him something of the smallpox and would forever preserve him uh, from it, adding that it was often used among the Gurmtees, uh, and whoever had the courage to use it was forever free from the fear of contagion. He described the operation to me and showed me his, uh, his arm, uh, the scar. Uh, so uh, that was basically the introduction of variolation uh, through Africa to, to, to the United States. Uh, the history of Onesimus is a little bit lost in history afterwards. Uh, he multiple times uh, tried to buy his uh, freedom, and uh, he was finally granted that in 1716. Uh, so uh, based on that information, other information from uh, slaves from Africa, actually, in addition to Onesimus, uh, there began the first inoculation campaign in the US. Um, so uh, Mather became a, a big proponent of variolation. Uh, in the 1720s, uh, there was a, a big outbreak in, of smallpox uh, in Boston. And people know that kind of the natural history of uh, smallpox and mortality uh, is approximately 30%. So obviously it's a quite dangerous disease. Uh, he wrote, uh, Mather wrote to uh, several doctors in Boston, uh, but only one doctor, Dr. Boylston, uh, agreed to, to help out with, uh, with inoculation. Uh, again, kind of a lot of this uh, talk is about history and ethics. Uh, so Boylston first inoculated his son, uh, but then he also inoculated his, his slave and then his slave son uh, and all uh, survived. Uh, so looking at the uh, inoculation campaign, just like now, there was a lot of resistance to vaccination. There was at the time, there was a concern that uh, you could spread the disease secondarily, which is true. Uh, there also was a lot of um, prejudice against the origin, the African origin of variolation. 
And there's also kind of the idea that uh, you're inoculate, you're infecting someone who's healthy uh, with a live virus. Uh, so there's a fair amount of resistance. Uh, Mather and Boylston were both threatened by with violence. A hand grenade was thrown into uh, Boylston house where his wife and child was. Didn't explode, luckily, but um, there were, there was a threats. And Boylston actually was arrested uh, by authorities for for doing vaccination. Uh, and then forbidden uh, in November. Their studies, though, were pretty conclusive. They uh, found that among people who were inoculated, you still had a real mortality, actually, because you were giving people live smallpox, but a lower dose. That two and a half percent of folks died that they inoculated uh, compared to the general population where mortality was eight uh, percent. So after this uh, kind of ex experience in Boston, uh, it became widely used in a pre, -clo pre colonial or colonial uh, United States. Washington inoculated his whole army prior to Valley Forge. Here's another uh, photo. Uh, this is a, a English woman, uh, Larry Mary uh, Pierpont. You see, she looks very aristocratic and and lovely. It was said she got smallpox and it really disfigured uh, her face. Uh, so she, you know, maybe perhaps to do that, she uh, was a very strong proponent of uh, variolation. Um, she was. Um, uh, in 1715, disfigured. Her husband was an ambassador uh, to the Ottoman Empire. And while she was in Turkey, she learned of uh, variolation. Uh, she, uh, she enlisted their family physician, Dr. Maitland, to inoculate her two children uh, for, to smallpox. Uh, unfortunately, he also did experiments uh, on prisoners and orphans. And a lot of these experiments at this time also challenged folks with smallpox afterwards. Uh, after kind of it was accepted uh, within England, uh, the Princess of Wales inoculated her two children uh, in 1700, it became uh, commonplace. Interestingly, um, you know, even after uh, the vaccination actually became available for smallpox, variolation was used uh, in more rural areas. Uh, variolation meaning you're giving a small dose of smallpox up until the eradication of smallpox in, in uh, 1979. All right, here's another question. This one might be easier. Uh, James Fibbs. Okay, good. No one's using Google, which is good. So we'll move on here. We'll tell this story. Uh, here's Jenner, uh, who's inoculating uh, his gardener's son, uh, James Fibbs, uh, with uh, smallpox. Uh, it's a, obviously a, a not a photograph, but a, a art, art piece of that. Um, so Edward Jenner uh, in smallpox. Um, you know, there's a lot of information. Again, you know, you see who gets credit for things and where actually the work was done. Um, in the countryside in England, uh, in Germany, uh, there was a lot of folk wisdom that uh, folks who had been uh, infected with cowpox, which is an infection that's uh, endemic in, in livestock, um, they would, is closely related enough to smallpox, they wouldn't later get smallpox. In art at the time, there was a lot of images of milkmaids because they, they only got uh, cowpox on their hands and smallpox didn't occur on their face. They're shown very as beautiful uh, in art. Uh, in uh, prior to us, uh, Jenner uh, inoculating folks with um, vaccinating folks against smallpox, there is at least six reports of different people uh, giving the, the cowpox, called, also known as vaccinia, uh, to prevent smallpox beginning in the 1770s, prior to Jenner's discovery in, in the late uh, 1790s. Uh, so, what happened in terms of the story? A local milkmaid, uh, Nel uh, Sarah Nelms, came. Uh, to, to see uh, Jenner for cowpox. And he had heard about uh, the information on uh, using it to prevent uh, smallpox. So then he uh, inoculated his, uh, uh, the son of his gardener, uh, James Phipps, uh, with x from her sores. And that was in, in May. Uh, and then in um, a couple months later in July, uh, he tested whether he was truly immune uh, and no disease uh, developed. 
you know, they actually became uh, friends uh, or they became were close throughout their life. Uh, later in uh, uh, Phipps's life, uh, Jenner gave him a cottage uh, in appreciation for his, his role, I guess, as, as a person who went first in the, in the smallpox, uh, at least the best uh, known smallpox uh, vaccine study. If you look in uh, England uh, after the uh, introduction of uh, smallpox vaccines, you see smallpox was a very common disease. This just looks at um, a study from graveyards. I think I'm not sure exactly how they looked at. Um, I think evidence of smallpox basically in, in skeletons. I guess they they looked at, and you see uh, there was a big decline in, in death from smallpox after uh, the introduction of uh, smallpox vaccines. And then uh, bring it to uh, the United States uh, in the 19th century. Um, the, there was uh, in about 1800, so just four years later, uh, a man named Benjamin Waterhouse vaccinated his five-year-old son. Uh, he also did you know, unethical experiments as well, um, where consent presumably isn't uh, acquired, but he inoc inoculated um, orphans as well. Um, there was a limited stock because it was a natural infection. So you had to basically either um, sort through, uh, find some cows who were infected, or after someone got sick, you would basically get their material and give it on to someone else. Um, unfortunately, also because you're getting it without any real, um, uh, real sanitary precautions, you call, could also uh, transmit other infections like tuberculosis and syphilis uh, by vaccination. The first laws around compulsory vaccination actually were the early 1800s in Massachusetts. Uh, in addition uh, to kind of these legitimate folks who were doing vaccination, there are a lot of people who were doing fraud because uh, kind of there wasn't a lot of regulation around vaccination that time. Uh, so I wanted to go through the early anti-vaccine movement and, and soon it'll start to tie into the current uh, era we're living in. Um, this is a photo of, um, people may have seen this because actually it was in the New York Times recently uh, as well. Uh, but it's basically kind of the ideas people had around the, the cowpox vaccine. It was obviously taken from cows. And this kind of shows people's fears that you might get like cow related features after getting, um, after getting uh, the cowpox vaccine. Uh, you know, some people would say like, you're kind of get hairy maybe on your face or your arm after you got vaccinated because of your uh, kind of turning into a cow. Of course, there's nothing about a cow is a virus, not a cow virus or anything like that. But these were some of the um, rumors uh, that were spread at, spread at this time. So there were certainly even at that time in the 1800s, there was kind of a conspiracy type theories around vaccines. Uh, in terms of the more formal movement, uh, the, you know, as I said, there's uh, the cow-like attributes appearing in vaccine recipients. Uh, in the eight, mid 1800s, uh, England uh, started to require all infants to be vaccinated by age three months. There's a pound fine for those not complying. And there started to be some protests uh, from people that these laws impinged on their liberty. Uh, the Anti-Vaccination League, Anti-Compulsory Vaccination Leagues were formed. Uh, there was large demonstrations. The biggest uh, were uh, in Leicester, where almost 100,000 folks demonstrated against these compulsory laws. Some people preferred to go to jail rather than let uh, people vaccinate their children. In the US, um, I just show a picture here, uh, the vaccine being this snake that's gonna steal your baby away, um, uh, kind of scary images. The, in the US, uh, in the 19th century, uh, it wasn't quite as organized. I guess it's more, we're more of a rural country at the time. This movement wasn't quite as strong. There were laws on the books around vaccination, but they weren't really enforced in the first half of the 19th century. Uh, but then kind of as 1800s came along and more uh, urbanization occurred, uh, smallpox was on the rise in the 1870s and laws started to be enforced. And around that time, the first anti-vaccine society was founded. Uh, Police in the 1890s started forcibly to oversee vaccinations. Uh, one kind of anecdote, uh, which, which sounds like it could have, could happen today, uh, in 1890s, uh, a young, uh, boy, Kenneth Little, 
Uh, he died of diphtheria seven months after being forcibly vaccinated for smallpox. Uh, his mother, um, you know, really felt like it was from uh, this from the vaccine. He be believed she believed that the vaccine uh, had weakened him, uh, and then later on he was susceptible to diphtheria, uh, so kind of uh, polluted his his clear clean body. Uh, the first uh, vaccine, the kind of the first major court challenge to these laws uh, was a Supreme Court case, uh, J Jacobson versus Massachusetts in 1905. Uh, there are um, 11 states had vaccine laws at that time, uh, but certain uh, in Massachusetts, local towns made laws. Uh, they said every town can you know, make their own law. Um, and there's a $5 fine for not complying. Uh, there is a pastor. Uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, who, when he was in Sweden, he had some negative experiences with vaccines. He didn't want his family to be vaccinated. He felt the laws encroached on his liberty and was unreasonable, arbitrary, and oppressive. Again, sounds like something people could say today. Um, so in a, it went to the Supreme Court. Uh, Justice uh, John Marshall Harland uh, wrote, Real liberty for all could not exist under the operation of principle, which recognized the right of each individual person to his own liberty, whether in respect of his person or property, regardless for the injury that may be done to others. Kind of a, the idea that your freedom to swing your fists uh, ends at your neighbor's jaw. Uh, Justice Harlan had a great history. Uh, he was the only person who dissented in Plessy versus Ferguson. He is really known as a real uh, civil rights advocate. Uh, in the early 1900s, although in this case, he, he advocated kind of for the government's uh, control over certain aspects of individual liberty. Uh, so looking at uh, moving forward kind of vaccinology in the 20th century, um, here's a few pictures. Uh, anyone enter, can any, and when anyone identify any of these three photos? People must be able to do this one. I'm just calling people. What do you think, Cindy? Cindy, uh, Cindy was active on the cow one. She's got to know a few of these. I'm here, but I really don't know. You don't know none of those Sorry. pictures. How about that first, that middle one's got to look pretty familiar to you. I'm not good with history. Oh yeah, there we go. We got polio, oh, iron God. lung. There we go. Good. Iron lung, good. good. Um, yeah, no, no. Yeah, the third one, the one on the right is not uh, that uh, the lady whose cells were used, but that's a good uh, guess. Um, and... Um, uh, the interesting thing in terms of the iron lung, I always thought it was interesting uh, how it worked. So as you know, like it, a ventilator, it's basically like a primitive re ventilator, but a ventilator uses positive pressure to get one's lungs uh, to expand, but a uh, iron lung uses negative pressure. So basically just sucks out the chest. And while that happens, um, uh, you breathe. Uh, so you see a, that was a little uh, baby. Uh, that was in uh, the iron lung because uh, he had, he he or she had uh, given uh, had had polio. Um, the fellow on the left is uh, Jonas Salk. Uh, people know him for the the uh, for the uh, discovery of um, a polio vaccine. Uh, the woman on the right is Rachel Schneerson, who's instrumental in developing the Haemophilus B uh, uh, vaccine, which is can cause meningitis, the, the infection. Okay, so moving on uh, to polio, I think it's an uh, uh, interesting story about how the vaccine was developed and kind of uh, societal changes since then. Uh, so uh, it was polio is an infection where a lot of people were asymptomatic. 70% of people were asymptomatic. About 25% of people had minor symptoms uh, like fever, um, sore throat, maybe diarrhea. And then 5% uh, of people could have more uh, severe infection, uh, like um, uh, neck stiffness, pain in the arms and legs. And then a, a small percentage, one out of 200, uh, 
would develop uh, paralytic disease, where they would develop weakness. Uh, as one got older, uh, the risk of uh, paralytic disease would increase. So babies, not so commonly. Older children, uh, commonly, would develop uh, paralysis. So in the 1950s, there was a big outbreak, about 3,000 deaths, 21,000 with uh, paralytic symptoms uh, in the 1950s. And looking at the clinical trials at the time, I like uh, the picture of all the people just volunteer, all the school children volunteering to be part of the, the study. Uh, and it was a giant uh, study. Salk um, uses killed uh, vaccine as opposed to Sabin vaccine, which people know as a, as a live vaccine. But the, Sab the Salk was the first study. In 54, uh, 1.8 million school children participated in the trial. Uh, there were a ton of uh, community volunteers, over 100,000 volunteers uh, helped out with the study. Um, and it, it was a huge uh, success. You know, just a year later after the introduction of the study, it was shown to be effective. It reduced childhood paralytic disease by uh, two thirds. Uh, and, and here's just some photos from the time uh, around, uh, you know, in the, head, in the headlines, in the New York Times and other uh, major newspapers about uh, its approval. Um, you know, and I was going to talk about uh, the clutter uh, story or the cutter debacle because it was uh, interesting around uh, medic medication safety. So licenses uh, were given to several companies to manufacture the Salk vaccine on the same day uh, that the uh, vaccine trials were announced. So April 12th, 1955, several companies had been working on manufacturing it before it was um, approved. And so once it was approved, uh, they said, go ahead, uh, start uh, shipping out vaccine. So actually, uh, even the, the first day it was approved, 165,000 vaccine doses were shipped. Uh, just a week, uh, a little bit later, to a little bit uh, more than two weeks, an Idaho child uh, had died of polio after getting the uh, cutter vaccine. Uh, they uh, recalled the vaccine on the same day, uh, but over 120,000 folks had already been vaccinated with the product. Remember, it's a killed virus. Um, so, uh, and among those 120,000 children who had been vaccinated with this, 40,000 developed polio. Uh, 51 became paralyzed, five died. Uh, there were secondary infections of, uh, from family members, uh, and um, another 113 were paralyzed, and five additional individuals died. And um, interestingly, uh, the, um, there had been warnings about the safety of this product. Uh, a, a senior scientist at NIH, uh, Bernice Eddy, uh, she was a woman who worked there for many years, uh, all the way from the 30s, I think into the 60s. She had told her boss uh, that when she had injected some monkeys deck, she had gotten uh, real polio. Uh, and so she was concerned about the preparation, but it was just ignored uh, her, uh, her statements, uh, and then it, they had gone forward uh, with, the, with this uh, preparation. In terms of other types of side effects people have seen in the modern era, um, there are some vaccines, you can actually get worse disease after you uh, receive it. So RSV, something called enhancement. Uh, so basically you don't uh, produce a neutralizing antibody, but you produce uh, some immune response that uh, worsens your exposure to the infection. So uh, to RSV, uh, there, to one vaccine, there was enhancement. Uh, Guillain-Barre was seen at high rates uh, with the swine flu vaccine in the 70s. Uh, narcolepsy was uh, seen uh, with one uh, H1N1 uh, uh, European uh, formulation, uh, pan Pandermix. And there was also a dengue vaccine enhancement uh, in 2017. Um, despite these issues, uh, it's, uh, vaccines are estimated to prevent at least 2,000 deaths, 2 million deaths, excuse me, annually uh, from uh, vaccine preventable diseases. So in terms of, I think this is an important topic that I'm going to get on to uh, more into um, where we are with coronavirus right now. So in terms of vaccine regulation, uh, Interestingly, in the 1800s, I said, there really wasn't any regulation around vaccines and their production. Uh, there was a act in the 18, 1813, I'm just playing around with this stuff, um, sorry, uh, which uh, was assessed, was uh, an act that was created to ensure the purity of vaccines, but there was no funding actually to do that. The first agent of this act was James Smith, 
he oversaw the vaccination of 100,000 individuals, so he's working hard. But in the 1820s, he actually mailed some smallpox uh, to North Carolina uh, instead of cowpox. And then uh, 60 people uh, after that uh, became infected with smallpox and 10 died. So there was a big uh, outcry over that event and he was uh, let go and the whole act was repealed. And there really wasn't anything after that. Um, in the early 1900s, uh, there was a Biologics Control Act uh, to ensure purity and safety of serums and vaccines. Uh, FDA prevented misbranded adulterated drugs uh, and also created the FDA. Uh, but there was a Supreme Court ruling that said basically these laws weren't as strong, very strong. They could only um, deal with the labeling of drugs, but not whether uh, drugs, false things were being claimed about the drugs. There were lots of kind of false claims at the time. Uh, there, here's a picture on the right of uh, Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup. Uh, it was basically a combination of straight morphine and alcohol. So not surprisingly, if you gave that to your infant, they would call them their colic. But unfortunately, lots of um, kids would never wake up after they received that, the, um, uh, the syrup. A lot, but, but people didn't really necessarily make the, the connection because their child was ill. Um, and um, people didn't really have the same idea about morphine uh, in the early 1900s. In the early, like 1910, basically, uh, they prevented this company from including uh, morphine. Uh, but in, this is just an example of kind of lack of regulation uh, at the time. Uh, moving forward, uh, there's uh, there's this elixir sulfonylamide and uh, this company called SC Mazingel. So in the 1930s, they created a sulfur preparation uh, using diethylene glycol, uh, which is something we see in antifreeze right now. Um, it's a great solvent, but it can lead to renal failure. And the chief chemist, he didn't know about this toxicity because it had just been reported um, not that long before. Uh, and so he included that. Uh, he added a raspberry flare, flavor to this antibiotic. Uh, no safety was required. Safety studies were required at this time before uh, drugs were sent to market. And about over 100 deaths were attributed to this medication due to renal failure. Uh, the owner of the company wasn't uh, particularly uh, remorseful. Uh, he said, we've been supplying a legitimate professional demand and not once could have foreseen the unlooked uh, for results. I do not feel there was any responsibility on our part. Uh, the chief scientist uh, before he uh, faced trial ended up uh, committing suicide. Uh, as a result of uh, this um, type of uh, event, uh, the uh, Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act uh, was uh, passed. Uh, and uh, it was passed in 18, 1938, FDR was president. Uh, it required pre-marketing uh, safety testing. It banned false therapeutic claims, uh, but it didn't require any efficacy data uh, for drugs. Uh, you know, later changes to this act kind of uh, lead to our current, current system. Uh, certain drugs in the 50s became prescription only. Uh, thalidomide, which is a big story, which I'm not going to go into, uh, led to a tighter control of uh, drug studies. And then the uh, 1960 law finally required uh, medications uh, to demonstrate efficacy before they're approved. Moving forward uh, to uh, the more current era, uh, in the early HIV era, drugs were really slow uh, to get approved. There, you see on the right, a fellow uh, with the organization called ACT UP uh, has a shirt, if I die of AIDS, uh, forget burial, just drop my body on the steps of the FDA. There were protests at a lot of different conferences. Uh, FDA also, also got um, a lot of uh, grief for how slow things were coming out. Um, at that time, uh, the FDA allowed for these treatment ID INDs, um, pre-approval access to drugs. Uh, and that kind of led to our EUAs. Uh, They're authorized originally in the 1930s. Basically, it's an unapproved, it can permit the use of use of an unapproved drug um, or unapproved use of unapproved use of an approved drug. So like hydroxychloroquine uh, in the in our current era would be an example of a unapproved use of an approved drug. Obviously remdesivir would be an example of a, a use of an unapproved drug uh, for treatment of COVID. 
Uh, the, the criteria is quite vague for what a UA uh, requires. When it's reasonable to believe that the drug may be effective to prevent, diagnose, or treat serious or life-threatening disease or conditions that can be caused by a chemical, biologic, radiologic, and nuclear agents. Uh, in the just comparison of our what's going on now to what happened in our last respiratory pandemic, was, uh, which was the H1N1 flu uh, pandemic, uh, there was a, a EUA for uh, Tamiflu to treat um, uh, infants. And there was also a um, IV uh, medication, param Paramavir, uh, which was given to EUA and also PCR. So those are the three. In our um, current pandemic, there have been numerous uh, UAs uh, offered, some for um, uh, diagnostics like PCRs, um, treatments, and then vaccines. Um, with various levels of eff uh, efficacy. So things like convalescent plasma or hydroxychloroquine didn't have a ton of evidence, while some have been improved with uh, based on data from uh, phase three studies. So looking at vaccines, um, you know, as people know, prior to uh, this um, pandemic, the fastest vaccine developed had been the mumps pan uh, vaccine, which it, it took about four years uh, to develop. Uh, this vaccine uh, was uh, developed much faster than most people predicted. Uh, the first description of the disease uh, was the end of the year 2019. Uh, Pfizer was approved uh, for emergency use in the U.S. Uh, less than a year later, uh, December 11, 2020. Uh, eight vaccines have already been approved for use uh, globally, uh, three in the United States. Uh, just looking at uh, people at the different vaccines, you'll probably all familiar with this. There's the Pfizer, Moderna. J and J, Novavax, AstraZeneca; those are the ones probably in the U.S. that we hear the most about. Um, the efficacy uh, and kind of the dosing is, is slightly different, but all importantly, they all prevent against severe disease uh, and hospitalization and death quite well. Uh, variant data also looks uh, generally pretty good uh, for most of the of the vaccines as well. In terms of, um, I'm going to finish up relatively quickly and see if anyone has any questions. Uh, in terms of progress uh, to date, I'm sure everyone's been following uh, the graphics state by state. Uh, at this point, over half Americans uh, have received um, one vaccine dose at least. Uh, among adults, uh, almost two thirds of adults uh, have, have received a, a vaccine uh, at, the, at least one dose at this point. Uh, California is doing slightly better uh, than uh, uh, than average. Uh, we have 57% uh, of people in California receive one vaccine dose, 69% of adults overall. There's huge regional differences. Uh, Marin County is number one, followed a short, you know, followed by um, uh, San Francisco slightly below. 74% uh, of uh, Marin residents have received at least one dose. And But if you look at another large county in the Central uh, Valley, like Kings County, only less than 30% of uh, folks from King County, Kings County uh, has received, have received, that's like where Merced is, have received uh, one dose of a vaccine. Uh, the other thing, in addition to kind of regional differences, there's a lot of disparities based on uh, age, uh, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic uh, status, uh, urban versus rural, uh, education level as well. Those are all kind of our things that uh, are associated with uh, different levels of vaccination. Uh, in terms of um, vaccine hesitancy, and I, I talked a bit about it before, so I was going to bring it uh, back to that. It's not a new thing, I think. It's just kind of amplified in our current environment. Um, you know, certain things have been uh, are shared among folks who are vaccine he hesitant. You know, just as before, really a big value on individual liberty. Uh, you know, so folks who, who feel like it shouldn't be the government's role to decide uh, who should get uh, vaccinated. Um, secondly, kind of a distrustful of individuals in power. So generally a distrust of the power structure. And that can be for a lot of different reasons, whether it be a historical um, in terms of people's experience with government and things like that. Uh, there's also idea about uh, the body being uh, a feeling that their body is pure and they don't want to have it kind of um, spoiled uh, by a vaccine. So you remember the story of the uh, the um, boy who had died of uh, after diphtheria, whose mother thought it was um, the vaccine that kind of spoiled his immune system. 
uh, and also just a more frequent believer in conspiracy theories. And, and conspiracy theories, uh, or maybe you call them myths, uh, are believed by a lot of different people. Um, unfortunately, I guess, um, as people have a hard time sorting through kind of true information and, and, and not um, looking at uh, where we are in terms of who's going to get vaccinated. About 25% of Americans in recent surveys say they basically won't get vaccinated against COVID-19. So we still have a fair amount of way to go to get to that 75% if, if everyone else ends up getting vaccinated. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who are waiting. I see a lot of people in clinic who come in, um, see me and say, oh, should I get vaccinated? I'm like, yeah, you definitely should get vaccinated. So that, I think a lot of people are waiting to kind of see their doctor, talk it over with them, um, with him or her. And, um, you know, so I think there is a way to go. And, and perhaps some of these um, patients or people who are saying they never will get vaccinated with some time will get some more information. And I think that's what I got. That's what I wanted to talk about. I think I, I went through the history of vaccines, uh, took it to the COVID-19 vaccine, talked a little bit about uh, hesitancy, the approval process. Hopefully it's interesting. Uh, I thought it was also, um, I heard you were having a talk, talk on um, GCP next week. I think kind of the ethics of clinical trials, I didn't necessarily um, talk about explicitly, but you can see how that's evolved over the years as well. So I'm, I'm happy to take any questions, comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Grant. Um, so please, uh, uh, everyone, you can unmute yourself to ask uh, any questions or put it in the chat. So. Yes, we will um, share the slides. And we also have the recording that will be available on our website. Um, and we will also send out an evaluation. Um, so if you could complete the evaluation, some of you uh, have requested um, continuing education units. And uh, if you can complete your evaluation uh, and put your name down on the evaluation, you will be uh, eligible for two um, continuing education units. So I will send out the evaluation uh, survey um, soon. Yes, yeah, so Suma asked a question about compassionate use. You basically have to do an individual IND is the way I, when I've done compassionate use. So it's not like versus when it's um, a EUA, it, for a clinician, you basically just have to use it within the, um, you, have to, you don't have to do any extra paperwork. So I guess, they're slightly different um, processes, uh, but still they allow um, use uh, prior to full approval. I think the EUA, um, for instance, for HIV, they never would give EUAs, but like they say, when a new drug was available, it'd be available for a compassionate use. Um, so you would have to um, uh, kind of do you know, you'd submit, you basically submit stuff to the IRB. Uh, you, it's a little bit of a tedious process. You write to the company um, versus the EUA is kind of a more broad process, but still they both allow for use of drug uh, prior to full FDA approval. Um, the, um, the Amanda's asking um, about whether, um, you know, idea of herd immunity, I think people probably have looked at, um, Julie Parsonet's talked a lot, of, I think there was a grand rounds about that uh, recently, uh, medical grand rounds. And, uh, um, you know, the, um, I think we, perhaps it's not a, a goal, the idea that it's gonna be like um, smallpox or measles uh, where, uh, we can vaccinate our way entirely out of it where it's no longer a concern, probably is not going to be the case. So it's probably more going to be like uh, a disease that we turn into a, a pandemic into something kind of a manageable endemic infection. Um, the Cindy asks, um, is there a simple way to change people's idea of what they say they'll never get the COVID vaccine? I saw a patient in clinic uh, that I've known 15 years uh, with at least a long time uh, with HIV. 
um, who came in. I was asked, I've been asked by my patients whether they've been vaccinated. And she's like, nope. Uh, and then she really uh, went through a lot of different uh, conspiracies about how she believed people were dying from the vaccine, how it was all pandemic, uh, how it's not FDA approved. Um, you know, maybe it was four different, five, oh, it was a gene therapy. Uh, in, in several, um, you know, I felt, and then we talked a little bit about it and I just felt like it, we, um, you know, I, I think it's, uh, a lot of people's kind of people, it's kind of tied in people's core identities, some of these things. So it's hard to kind of change someone's, uh, core identity, people thinking uh, like very focused on individual liberties and distrustful of um, of of kind of government, and if they're really strongly held beliefs, you not, might not be able to uh, turn those around. But certainly, I think people want to make a distinction between like vaccine refusal and vaccine hesitancy. So I think you certainly can get around vaccine hesitancy. And then um, the let's see uh, how soon you know the FDA. Um, changed their guidance. You can get uh, the vaccine after you have COVID. They originally said a lot of, <coughs> you know, they originally were saying three months, but that they've get, gotten rid of that recommendation. As soon as you recovered from coronavirus, you can get vaccinated. There's no reason to wait. Um, and uh, as uh, in terms of Diana's question, um, the, you know, even though, um, the, you know, smallpox isn't that re closely related to chickenpox, even though they're, you know, have pox at the end, even though their clinical manifestations are relative, are somewhat similar. Uh, so I would say that um, that's why we still have like chickenpox and other types of pox uh, viruses as well. I think I've answered all the questions I've seen. Any other questions? Um, could you speak to the um, safety of messenger RNA type of vaccines? Um, because it's uh, definitely uh, something that is uh, like a viral vector that is being inserted into our genes. So uh, because especially these two COVID vaccines have not been uh, studied long time, uh, do you see any uh, implication for long run? Um, that yeah, that's a good question. Something. I think there's a lot of um, thoughts on um, on that question, but not everything you said is actually true. Um, so people get confused about RNA and DNA. Um, so RNA is is really just a uh, way uh, to get the body to create protein, and it's used in a lot of different. Uh, you know, it's used by the body in its own process, but it doesn't ever get incorporated into the DNA. And the body has ways to break down uh, RNA quite quickly. Otherwise we'd just be producing all types of protein we don't want to. So basically what happens is even though it's a new technology, um, the end product is quite similar to other vaccines. You get the body produces protein and then the body, um, the body produces immunity to that um, protein, just like it would be for like a regular flu shot, where you actually get the real uh, protein injected into your arm. It just is a more efficient way of getting the protein into this into the blood. Uh, in terms of the long term safety, the mRNA, when we've seen adverse events from vaccines, they're short term, they're not something that occurs 10 years later, because there's things that can happen to a vac. there's two things, there's a short term issues, maybe you could get anaphylaxis, uh, maybe it could be a really severe arm or a high fever. Um, the, um, and then there's a sh the kind of the short, medium type term things like the autoimmune responses. So um, the things like that, um, like the rare side effect to, to the J&J &J vaccine, the blood clots is due to an autoimmune response. Other types of things like Guillain-Barre, also autoimmune response. But those are the immune uh, response happens relatively early. So we're gonna see any of the adverse events from uh, immune, um, you know, from uh, autoimmune things quite 
quickly as well. So I would say we have had experience with a billion, over a billion people now um, uh, getting the vaccine. So it's amazingly with as much scrutiny in terms of safety as any vaccine in history. So even though it's relatively new, uh, the, the, the side effects we really look for in vaccines are relatively short term. They're not things that are, we're going to see five years later because you know, we've already seen the, the vaccines long gone for your body. The immune response is it was kind of peaked and then you just have the memory immune response left. So to me, it um, the concerns around things that we, it's different than a medication where you're taking it every day. So they, some of those side effects may come up longer term. Uh, this is long gone from your body. So I don't think the longer term uh, effects of vaccines uh, is something that's been reported in any of the vaccines that have been given uh, kind of through human history. Um, someone else is asking um, the about kind of, um, you know, using uh, things that haven't been uh, looked at. Um, yeah, Donna Williams, they've changed uh, um, guidelines. Now you can get, uh, you can get vaccines at the same time. Uh, because it's shown to be safe. It, a lot of it's just to look for side effects more carefully, uh, but now you can get shingles and COVID vaccine. COVID and shingles now are not live uh, vaccines. Um, the, um, I, I saw something in the newspaper today I thought was interesting. Over 50% of people uh, believe in at least one myth about coronavirus or coronavirus vaccine. So it's obviously, you know, there's a lot of information out there some correct, some not. So it's important to try to, to sort through everything. Um, in terms of whether one has to give the vaccines on exactly the same schedule as um, has, been, has been looked at, it, certainly I would say certainly not. Uh, the immune system is much smarter than that. You don't have to just have an exposure three weeks or four weeks. Those are just done this in the settings of clinical trials uh, because you do want a protocol. Certainly, if you delay the second dose, like in England they're doing, you'll eventually get to very close to the same place. Um, so I think from a practical standpoint, uh, that makes sense uh, if there are limitations. Uh, the hardest thing is if you don't bring people back soon, uh, you might lose, the, lose them to follow up. So I think I'm, I'm relatively happy with it, how we were able to stick with the schedule here. Um, and yes, you certainly can get different vaccines. Uh, your, your immune system is smarter than should be able to respond. We don't know exactly um, the antibody levels and whether it's exactly the same effect, but it certainly is reasonable if also there are limitations around um, dosing. Um, yeah, and, and there's emergence, emerging data on mi mixing and matching, not so much on efficacy, but uh, antibody response. Do we know how often do we have to come back to be vaccinated? Uh, that's to be determined. You know, people were saying there's some data that were out and uh, I think it was in Nature Medicine this week that uh, was encouraging in terms of the potential durability of vaccine response. We see people who've been vaccinated a year ago in their early clinical trials uh, are doing just fine now. Uh, so I think uh, it doesn't look like it's going to be this winter. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised in the next few years people get a booster. But the truth is probably the um, just like tetanus, if you got in the first vaccine series, you're probably going to be okay if you actually did get tetanus, maybe not fully protected. So we'll see what the uh, booster data shows over time. Yeah, but I think it's interesting. The, um, I think uh, Cindy's question about how you try to convince people um, you know, I think there was, there was a nice little chat box people might have seen in the New York Times. It wasn't perfect, but around kind of like a motivational interview and kind of meeting people where they are um, and kind of uh, not trying to shame them or anything like that. Just kind of say, okay, this is, you know, these are your thoughts, things like that. Um, okay. Uh, one, I think, I think we're good here. Um, oh, he got the Cena farm. was wondering, yeah, definitely the person around getting the Sinopharm and then later getting the Pfizer is totally fine. But I would say probably also the, um, all these vaccines prevent against severe disease. 
So it's not, a, it, it may uh, protect you more against milder disease if you end up getting the Pfizer vaccine. So um, it's not a bad idea, but I wouldn't say it's required either. Can you speak a little bit about the AstraZeneca vaccine? It seems the United States doesn't uh, have, haven't been had marketed, but in other countries they are using it, and there is high rate of death. Um, so, um, well, what 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 do you see uh, happening with that? Well, high is a you know I think it's interesting um, the the rates of um, what you're referring to in terms of adverse events are um, uh, this uh, thrombocytopenic uh, thrombocytosis, right? Cerebral, you know, cerebral venous thrombosis, uh, or also some abdominal clots. Very rare, one out of 100,000. So 909, if 909 or 99,999 people aren't gonna have uh, an adverse event, one out of 100,000 are, um, and, uh, you know, the J&J, &J, the number is about a tenfold less. One out of a million folks uh, have this very rare side effect. Um, the efficacy looks just fine for uh, AstraZeneca. Uh, and so the reason it hasn't been approved here, um, I think if there weren't other vaccines available, if we didn't have more than enough doses for everyone in the country, it certainly would have been approved without a doubt, I would say. Um, if, so I think it's really the, it's certainly beneficial for an individual's health to get whatever vaccines available to them in what, whatever region of the world they are. Um, but I think like many things in, in our modern society, uh, the rare events get a lot of information, got a lot, get a lot of news. So even though these adverse events are very rare, you know, they're in the news and people have a hard time sorting through probabilities. It's not something like humans are kind of programmed to understand that, you know, maybe you have a, um, you know, maybe you have a one out of 10 chance of getting COVID and you have a one in a hundred thousand chance of having a severe adverse event. People don't really appreciate, you know, there's several orders of magnitude between, between those. Um, the, someone asked about mandatory vaccination. Um, and I think when we when it's FDA approved, uh, that will probably change uh, people's thoughts on that. I don't think it's really fair to do mandatory vaccination when something's. Even though I know that I'm, you know, fully confident these vaccines will be FDA approved based on the data we've seen and that are available because uh, they're safe, very safe, and very effective. But at this point, they're still uh, emergency use. So I, I do think if I were a person in charge of this, I would certainly not mandate it while they're not FDA approved. Uh, in terms of um, influenza vaccine in, in, at Stanford, I believe you don't necessarily need to be, you might need a doctor's note. Uh, so I would think something like that would be reasonable. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily productive uh, to do that um, because I think people do have such strong beliefs, uh, whether, you know, maybe not all of them are, are based on, on, um, you know, data and, and uh, facts, but I feel like I'd prefer to, the Stanford at this point is moving through um, uh, for hospital staff are um, kind of trying to meet people where they are and encourage people to get vaccines. I'm a university staff, we're going to be required to get vaccinated. Uh, by um, uh, by September, which is fine with me as well. Um, so I think it's kind of going to be, I would kind of think you want to have uh, a div div diverse group of people uh, among kind of your group, kind of make it a collaborative decision rather than make a top-down decision. Because you kind of can see how, you know, there's a big been a big pushback over the years on various uh, mandatory vaccine rules. Um, you know, I wish everyone would get vaccinated, of course. I'm not sure around the, the you know, mandating it or not.
Okay, thank you so much. Uh, um, I really appreciate that. And of course, uh, the information you provided all uh, makes sense in terms of, uh, you know, educating public as well. So there is less vaccine resistance and uh, more understanding out there. Um, I see one more question coming in. Um, Let's see that one. Um, oh, who should not? Uh, there, you know, it's very, it's quite safe. You know, people, some people may not get as good of an immune response to it. Like if you are on, um, you know, people that are like transplant patients who are on certain medications, but they're not going to have more adverse events. Uh, you know, there's been you know, very rare cases of anaphylaxis um, the, that have been reported with Pfizer and, and Moderna. So I think if you have a history of anaphylaxis, you kind of talk to your um, a doctor. But I think it, uh, you know, there's good data in pregnant women that it's safe. Um, so I would think that there's not uh, too many reasons uh, why folks uh, should defer. You know, people, it's not a lot of people are waiting now around just making sure that they hear more information. Um, and so hopefully people are kind of sorting, finding kind of good, reliable sources. I think once it goes to doctor's offices, some people will be more happy about getting it at their doctor's office rather than in kind of a, what they view as a government uh, site. Yeah, Cindy asked me about masking. I think we'll, it'll all become clear. Um, Need is a strong word though, Cindy, because I don't think we need to right now. If everyone's vaccinated, we don't need to. Um, but I think um, the Stanford will probably kind of change the rules over the fall, uh, maybe summertime. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, so we'll wait and see about treatments. I think we're still, we're further along in vaccines and treatments. Cool. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a great Wednesday. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Grant. I appreciate it. Uh, it was very informative. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to stop recording um, so um, we can give.